There is a momentous contest going on right now, and whoever you support, it's going to be over soon enough. Uh, on, on Tuesday, I woke up at about four in the morning, and I couldn't go back to sleep, and I, I was just thinking about this, and my mind started racing, and I came to a decision. I was like, you know what? I'm going to tell them. I'm going to tell them. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and tell them. And I, I know what a lot of people already feel about in this contest. The one who I was supporting isn't in the race anymore, but when I think about who is left, I think I don't necessarily like the one, but I really don't like the other one. So I'm going to put all my cards on the table. I'm going to say, go Dodgers. I'm totally rooting for the Dodgers in the World Series. What can I say? So, thank you. Because I would rather be rooting for the Giants. Some of you might be wanting to root for the Padres. But, you know, I cannot abide the Yankees. So, I mean, what else am I going to do? So, there you go. Go Dodgers. There you go. What, what did you guys think I was going to talk about? That's... It's, oh, that's right. You know, there is that presidential thing going on, too. <laughs> Some people are a little worked up about that. That also is going to be over pretty soon, too. I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> we are, uh, the election is upon us, and a lot of you maybe, have, has anybody already voted? How many people have already voted? Look at that. See? Me, too. I'm, I've already voted. So um, easy. Soon enough, it's all going to be decided. So clearly, when like a third of us have already voted, the point is not to convince us one way or the other. We're going to talk today about how we approach these things. Just how do we approach this whole issue? So talking about politics today is really a loaded question it's, because it's very divided. It's very charged. But what does it mean for us to navigate these things as followers of Jesus? That's what we're going to get at. Because in coming up to an election, you can imagine as a church, there's a few different ways that we could approach it. The first one is we could just say, hey, let's not talk about this at all. La, 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 right? That's one option. Very appealing. Um, but I think you would have noticed if we didn't talk about it at all. And, and frankly, um, our, our culture today is relatively shallow. And I think that it wouldn't be meaningful for us to demonstrate in a way that we don't talk about things that are important. Right? That, that we, we need to be able to talk about things. A lot of us uh, are, have a tendency to want to hide anyway from tough topics. Maybe you came from a, a family that doesn't do conflict very well. And so we haven't necessarily learned how to do those kinds of things very well. We didn't learn that we can have healthy disagreements. And so I, I didn't want to take that dire direction because it feels shallow. A lot of other churches maybe go full political, right? It's like all in. And what happens is that the, you, everything gets mixed together in an understanding like, if you are a follower of Jesus, you're supposed to go this way. And what that gets communicated as is, generally you're supposed to go whatever way the pastor goes. And then, um, but what that happens then is that churches just separate, right? We end up getting separated into churches where everyone looks the same. Where in the end, you can't disagree one way or the other, right? Because it ends up standing out. And, but here's the thing is that in our church, one of the things that we agree on or one of our the, the distinctive is that we want to major in the majors. We want to be able to stick to things and we, we allow each other to respectfully disagree on non-essential things. So I don't think my role is to tell you who you should vote for for the water board because <laughs> let's be real, your vote for the water board definitely matters more than the other votes, right? <laughs> I don't think that's the direction that we would go. And, and the, the thing was is that in the end what ends up happening is that some of us don't feel like we fit. And that's, that's definitely not the direction we want to go either. So the third way is to do kind of what we do best here, I think, which is to, to center ourselves on Scripture, to be able to say what does it mean for us to be people who are God-centered in all of our lives but allow each other to disagree and to feel unified even when we don't agree on all topics. That feels like we are united around the person of Jesus and around our shared mission and even kind of our own 
way of doing things, I suppose, like a, an attitude toward life. So we together, our mission, we want to glorify God in all that we do, and we want to equip Christians to live a full life in Jesus, neither of which requires me to vote for a specific waterboard person. So here's what I propose for this time. Uh, it seems like, as I've talked with a lot of people, the majority of people, even for the presidential election, I feel like they're mostly voting against somebody. Um, so uh, rather than fight that kind of feeling, what I, I want to go with it. Let's go with the fighting against thing. And so what we're going to do is for the next three Sundays, today and the next two, we're going to be talking about the election a little bit. And what we're going to do is we're going to talk about who we are not. That's the, the, the theme that we're going to have for this one. So we're going to be talking about who we are not. And so it's not taking my word for it. We're going to be looking at three quotes by Jesus. Maybe you're familiar with Jesus's I am statements. He makes a lot of very big I am statements in the book of John, in the gospel of John. He says things like, I am the bread of life. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. But several months ago, when I was planning this sermon series, not really knowing where we would be, um, well, as I thought about this, I was struck by how in the Gospel of John, uh, oddly enough, in chapter 8, we just finished Romans 8, but we're doing John 8 now. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, Jesus says three times who he is not. So he says, I am the bread of life, but he also says three times who he is not. He says, I am not alone. He says, also, that he is not of this world. And finally, he says, I am not seeking glory for myself. And so what we're going to do during these three weeks, we're going to address these three statements by Jesus and talk about some themes associated with them. So in talking about I am not alone, that's John 8, 16, we're going to talk about identity. John, uh, I am not of this world, John 8, 23. We're going to talk about mission, our shared mission together. And then in John 8, 50, he says, I am not seeking glory for myself. And so we're going to talk about having a pattern of humility. So we're going to think about these things together. And, you know, we, we don't really know which way the election is going to tip. But what I do know is that for us as followers of Jesus, whatever our political leanings and whoever might be president, our status as Jesus followers takes precedence over everything else. So... So we are people who are supposed to be shaped by Jesus' words, the life of Jesus. And so when we look at these statements by Jesus, we're going to see they actually have a power to be able to defy some of the common American political values of today. Because American political values would have us think, uh, be fueled by fear rather than by our identity in God. Uh, they would have us have our mission be fueled by cynicism of other people, probably mostly, or of the, of the world, rather than by God's mission. They would have us be guided by, by values that kind of espouse a, a winner-take-all type of view, or, or maybe to um, maybe pout and distract and cause problems when we're in the minority, which both parties do, rather than to be motivated by a Jesus-shaped way to have humility in love. So my prayer is, whatever is going on in the world that we as Jesus followers will center ourselves on our identity in Christ. That we'll be unified by our mission of hope and be guided by values that show a pattern of humility that becomes followers of Jesus. Amen. So I, I'm kind of telling you some of this stuff ahead of time because I don't know where it's going to go. Specifically, that third message is going to be after the, the election on humility. And I just want to say, we're, we're talking about humility, whoever wins, right? So that's what we're talking about. So uh, if you are going to be somebody who wants to follow Jesus deeply in the 21st century, these are the kinds of things that we need to think about because we need to live life together. And we need to have a unified message because Satan wants to divide us to d diminish our message. And we do not want that. There, there are churches out there that are kind of one-party churches. Uh, it, and I got to say, it's got to be more comfortable for, if you agree with everything. Uh, but I think that churches who agree that we're not going to agree on all those things are a bit better positioned to bring a unified message that Jesus is Lord. That, and that anyone in our community that we're going to be talking with, you can invite anybody that you run into 
to come and meet Jesus here. That's what I want because we have a shared mission. And it's going to require a bit of humility to live together because I don't normally support the Dodgers. <laughs> but I'm unified. <laughs> unified for a purpose. <laughs> to defeat the Yankees. <laughs> so we are, we're going to vote in different directions. But, but I want to say, in the future, we, I, I think that this is a chance this is a moment maybe where we are going to feel more unified than ever around our identity and our mission and our, and our purpose of living in, the, in humility together, uh, and not just during the election time, but maybe all the time. So uh, I, I know I'm not going to, uh, my purpose is not to at all change the way that you vote. What I hope is that we can change the way that we approach being American citizens today, and that has implications for us well beyond the election season. So let's, let's pray that it may be so. All right, that is for our whole series. Today we're going to talk about identity. As Christians, our identity, our sense of self, is that we are not alone. We are not alone. When my wife Karen and I uh, were in our 20s, we lived in Paris for a couple of years doing ministry there. And after about six months of living there, uh, one of the patterns that seemed to emerge, it was interesting, in my interactions with different people, I realized um, in my many interactions with French people, I noticed a couple things. One was they didn't oftentimes give their name very early in the conversation. They wouldn't let you necessarily know what their name was, and they certainly would not let you uh, know more about their profession. So it was really interesting, and we attended a church of maybe about 60 people, and I knew what like a couple of people did for their job, but like only a couple of people. I didn't know what most people did. And the rationale behind that, I'll tell you, a lot of them, they don't want to be pigeonholed, but they also, they don't want you, as you interact with them, uh, they're really sensitive to kind of socioeconomic di disparity, and they don't want you to be wondering all the time, like, how much, how much does she make? Right? They, they, they just want to be like, hey, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a person, I want you to interact with me like a person. But it was a little disorienting, because what are the first two ways that we tend to introduce ourselves? Give them my name and tell you what I do. So it was a little hard. You go, gosh, but how, do I, how do I interact with people? And it ended up um, shaping in some ways how I viewed identity. And it was helpful to do that. It, but it was disorienting. And, and our, our identity can be very grounding. When we, when we know our identity, we feel very grounded. But there are times when we don't feel stable in that. Think for a minute uh, about some of the most difficult moments in a person's life, kind of in the, in the lifespan of the average person, when are those most difficult moments? And this might be hard if you're much younger, you haven't necessarily been through all of these moments or to know that it was common to everyone. But when you think about adolescence, or, or maybe about the time that you were something like 25, we'll say, kind of go through like a thing, uh, in the uh, middle of your career at some point, or maybe right when you retire, there tend to be these moments of kind of crisis, right? And I think a lot of it is grounded in the question of who am I? Who am I becoming? What, what, what's going to happen with my life? And, and so it's actually a crisis of identity that happens in each of those places. When we retire, we say, well, am I anything beyond my job? Who am I now? Uh, what am I supposed to do with these years now that I have left? So these are unifying um, the unifying thing that's there is that these are difficult moments that fit around identity. I don't know if that resonates with you. So one of the things, though, that is compelling about Jesus Christ is that as you read the Gospels, it becomes very clear that he is a person with a very clear sense of self. His identity is never in question. And, and because of that, actually, he doesn't ever get taken off course, not by his enemies, but also not by his friends, which sometimes he has to fight against them as well. So today we're going to look at the first passage that we have in John 8 and see how Jesus' sense of identity We're going to help us understand how we can better inhabit this world today. This is John 8. You know, I have, uh, that's the only slide I've got for today. Um, so uh, we don't have to necessarily keep it up the whole time, but you're going to need your Bible with you because I normally I do um, put the scriptures on the, on the slides. I'm sorry, you can, um, if you have your Bible or your Bible app, open it up to John 8. And we're going to start in verse 12. You're welcome to just listen along as well. 
John 8, verse 12. When Jesus spoke again to the people, he said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Here, there's one of his I am statements, right? I am the light of the world. The Pharisees challenged him. Here you are, appearing as your own witness. Your testimony is not valid. Jesus answered, even if I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is valid. For I know where I come from, I came from, and where I am going. But you have no idea where I come from or where I am going. You judge by human standards. I pass judgment on no one. But if I do judge, my decisions are true because I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. In your own law, it is written that the testimony of two witnesses is true. I am the one who testifies for myself, and the other witness is the Father who sent me. Then they asked, Who is your Father? They're obviously confused. You do not know me or my Father, Jesus replied. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. He spoke these words while teaching in the temple courts near the place where the offerings were put. Yet no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Let's pray. Father, thank you, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the peace that we have and the freedom to be able to uh, openly meet as Christians. We know that is not the right of all of our brothers and sisters around the world. We, we pray this morning that you help us to understand your word so that we may understand better who we are not. And may that give us power to live fully for you as your children, clearly associated with you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, our, our, as Christians, our identity is in that we are not alone. Uh, when we think about who we are not, we know that we are not alone. Uh, and that was how Jesus described himself in, in there in the, the first of his I am not statements. I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. That's verse 16. And you, you are not alone. You're connected to God. So the first point is you aren't alone. And, and being connected to God is, is going to give us stability in uncertain times. In our passage here, Jesus is under attack, um, but he's not rattled because he holds on to his relationship with the Father. And, and we are living in unstable times. And as we move on in the dark, sometimes it makes us feel a little bit vulnerable. Uh, but Jesus, he says, his identity is not, is that he's not alone. Uh, I heard a joke that says, uh, you're not so much afraid of being alone in the dark as not being alone in the dark. <laughs> that's pretty funny. I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> Think about that one. That's kind of interesting. <laughs> All right, joking aside, though, we, we, we do know, though, that God's presence is with us in uncertain times, and, and it's a comfort to us. And, and when Jesus proclaims that he is not alone, he's actually echoing a lot of the, the verbiage of the Psalms that, that's there. Listen to a couple of these Psalms. And Psalm 18, 2 says this, the Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. Hear the protection like protection from outside things, and then the deliverer is the one who comes in and saves you. My God is my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Wow, just a piling up of images of protection. If God is with me, I am safe. Many of us have found encouragement in Psalm 23. Psalm 23, 4 says, Even though I walk through the darkest valley... I will what? I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So we have this image of the shepherd who's walking along with us, and, and we as sheep don't have to be afraid because we have our shepherd who's walking along with, with us. And so as we think about the weeks and months and years ahead, it might give you an uneasy feeling at times, but what would it mean for us to proclaim that we are God's sheep. He is our shepherd walking with us. I fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. So Jesus, he, he's convinced that he's not alone. But he stands with the Father who sent him. So 
I'll say clearly Jesus' identity is wrapped up in his mission. Um, in our, that's what we're going to talk about next week. But uh, the two are kind of interrelated. We have to admit that. Because uh, even in this passage, he says, I know where I came from and where I am going. So it's, it's, it's an identity statement, I know. Um, but he's also talking about his mission. This is, I know where I came from. I know where I'm going. Uh, so, but that's his identity, but it's also kind of a mission statement as well. Uh, and in next week's passage, he's actually going to do something similar. He says, he says this in verse 29, the one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. So he's saying a very, very purposeful statement about his identity. I know the one who sent me is with me. I'm not alone right now, but it's also he sent me. So there's a mission part. So we'll get to that a bit more next week. But how can this conviction that we are not alone, how can that help us to approach the world? In this series, I think we're focusing a bit more on, uh, on politics and the political instability in our world, but I think it has implications for a lot of our circumstances. Uh, you, you're not alone as you face the challenges in your life right now. You stand with the Father who sent you. That means you are not alone in that, this stage of parenting, wherever that may be. That means that you are not alone in your mental health struggles. It means that you are not alone as you try to figure out whatever the wise next step might be. We're not alone. So in, in all of our circumstances, we are not alone, and you always are with God. We are also with God's People, that's the next point. So you aren't alone. And being connected to God, secondly, causes us to identify with those who identify with the Father. Does that make sense? We identify with those who identify with the Father. He says, I am not alone. I stand with the Father who sent me. So it, it follows then that we, are, we can't be separated by our political affiliations because our allegiance is to God. And so we, we are standing with God. That's who we want to be with. And that it has a greater connection, a real power of unity. J just think for a second about the kind of immediate connection that you might feel, most of us, maybe you had a bad experience, the immediate connection you might feel with somebody who went to your high school. Right? You have kind of an immediate connection with them. Even if they went to the high school before or after you, you have kind of a little bit of school pride. Like, hey, we walked those same halls. We were in this same place. You have kind of an immediate connection with somebody without even knowing much more about them. But as followers of Jesus, we have a much deeper basis of connection. It's unity based not only on where we used to walk. It's, it's where we're going to be walking. We are unified for, for eternity together. And if you will forgive me another baseball illustration, tis the, tis the season. Um, there, there actually are some notable followers of Jesus on the Dodgers. Uh, Clayton Kershaw is probably the most vocal of them, most high profile. But um, I've heard that Dave Roberts, the manager, is also a believer. And Mr. Walk-Off Grand Slam home run guy, Freddie Freeman, also as well. So but what may surprise you, to your dismay, there are also some followers of Jesus on the Yankees as well. I know. I know. You, know, you want to know who is one of the most high-profile Christians? Aaron Judge. So uh, Clay Holmes are openly followers of Jesus. Conceivably, so I, I, maybe this, is, this isn't helpful to you. Maybe you don't, I don't know, whatever. But, but conceivably, some of these guys, before a game, could go out on the field and they could pray together, right? Because they're, they are brothers in Christ, and they're wearing different uniforms, but they are brothers in Christ. And what's interesting is that when you think about it, maybe people in the crowd would see them doing that, and they're like, no, 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 don't, don't be with those guys. They're the enemy. You can't be with those guys. But you know what? If they, if they are secure in their identity in Jesus... They know that they are wearing that uniform for right now, but they are going to be with Jesus for eternity. They're going to be together for eternity. So the, the, this is just a temporary thing. But it, so it doesn't matter if somebody else, whatever somebody else thinks. We can have that connection with each other. And, and when we think for a minute about politics, and when, when you think about maybe those bums on the other side, whatever that might be, uh, maybe, maybe you're like some weird fourth party and you think everybody's a bum, okay? 
But when we think about those, those losers who are voting for the other side, those losers are here. Okay? And, and so that's helpful. You know, somebody else thinks you, you know, take away nothing else from church today. Somebody else thinks you're a loser. <laughs> Just imagine what it's like to be a Giants fan in Simi Valley. (laughs) I think we as Christ followers, we can have courage to be able to defy what the crowd's expectations are. So when we think about the crowds, like whatever, these faceless crowds of people who are supporting one person or the other, we we feel like they're not going to want us to fraternize with the other people. But you know what? It doesn't matter. Who cares what the crowd thinks? We care what the Lord thinks, right? We care what the Father thinks, and that matters so much more. And, and you know what? Not only crossing the U.S. political divide. Let's be real. Let, we live in a world with political divides, and, and this connection to the Father crosses international borders as well, right? In verse 12, Jesus says, whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So who has the light of life? Anyone who follows him, and that crosses political divides. Whoever follows Christ has the light of life. And so there are people who follow Christ in places that we are politically opposed to. There are followers of Jesus in China. There are followers of Jesus in Iran who are persecuted for their faith, who pay great price. There are people who follow Jesus in North Korea, very improbably. So imagine for a minute what it would be like. It, it's so hard for these people to follow Jesus in these places. If anything, we should pray harder for people in those places that we are politically opposed to because it's so much harder for them to follow Jesus in those places. Imagine for a minute what it would feel like to have the same kind of easy unity with people who, are, who, who follow Jesus because that means they have the light of life what if it was so easy to, follow, to be united with them the same way that we feel with somebody who went to our high school or somebody who supports our same team? We just automatically feel like, oh, we're, we're, we're kind of together in this thing, right? Why can't we feel like that as Jesus followers? Because you and I, we're not alone. We are connected with everyone else who proclaims the name of our triune God, even followers of Jesus who support other teams. <laughs> Dirty rat. <laughs> Goodness sakes. This is what it's like to be persecuted. <laughs> I, I, I'll say a, kind of a short third point. Um, so the third point, we, we are connected to God. We are connected with other people who, who are connected to the Father. Um, I, I want to say... Uh, you're not alone, when we think about being alone, you're not alone in carrying this value. This might be important for a few people, I just want to say it briefly. One of the, one of the reasons sometimes why we feel really passionately for one side or the other is we feel like there is kind of a God value at stake, right? That there's, there's something that God cares about that I care about too because God cares about it. And so we have a sense that if we don't stand up for that thing, then Satan kind of wins, sort of thing. I just want to say that, that, that there is a, that's a good reason to work for that thing. That's good. Uh, but at the same time, we have to remember we're not alone. That if God does actually care about that thing, then God is going to carry the weight of worrying about that thing too. doesn't mean that we don't need to work. That's fine. But, but, but worrying about the consequences and how it's going to all work out, we, we sometimes unnaturally carry that ourselves. Like, it's my job to worry about this, and if I stop worrying, it's going to all fall apart. Okay, so the world is not waiting for you to worry about the thing. Um, it doesn't, God doesn't need you to worry about it for himself. We can pray for it. So that's, uh, I just want to make sure that I, I said that, that if God really does truly care about that, then what we learned about in Romans 8, God's going to bring it about, and nothing can stop that. All right, let's close with this bit. So the passage that we're looking at this morning, it says, Jesus says that he is the light of the world, and He's actually not asking for people to vote to elect him light of the world. He is the light of the world, whether you like it or not. And he's saying his testimony is valid, even if he's the only one saying it. So when you first 
heard this exchange. I don't know what you thought when you read this whole thing, because it's kind of funny. Like, they go, well, why do you, who do you think you are? You can say this. Don't you need somebody else to back you up and this stuff? It seems a little strange. And maybe you're thinking, why is this important? Why is it even here in Scripture? Why discuss the validity of his testimony? Uh, as we've seen, part of it is to underline Christ's connection to the Father. He has this inseparable connection to him. But I think there's an aspect of the reason why it's there is to actually invite us into the story. Follow me on this. He's wanting, John wants the reader to participate. Because he says, Jesus is, they're saying, the Pharisees are saying, Jesus' testimony is not valid by itself. But does it have to be by itself? I think what John is doing is he's inviting you and I, as we read this, to be additional witnesses who say, Christ is the light of the world. Jesus says that he is. The Father says that he is. So the, the blank then is like, are you agreeing with the Holy Spirit in you who's saying that he is? Will you be a witness to say, no, actually he is the light of the world. He's not speaking that on his own. If you've seen a production of Peter Pan by some of the amazing um, junior highs in, in the area. Um, one of the, you may know that one of the things in the Peter Pan musical is that it breaks the fourth wall, right? There's that part where you're supposed to clap for Tinkerbell. How many of you never clap for Tinkerbell? You never do, huh? They'd say clap, and you're like, you can't tell me what to do. Yeah, right? Um, okay. Tinkerbell dies because of that. So um, I think what John is doing, he's doing something similar. He's breaking that fourth wall, He's saying, you're reading this, but you need to not just be a reader now. You are a witness. If you are reading this story about Jesus, you are a witness. So we need to not just read about Jesus, but we are called to be participants in the story. So he's saying, here Jesus is standing before this group of people, and he's saying, I am the light of the world. And the Pharisees say, you're testifying for yourself. And John is inviting you to raise your hand and say, no, he is not. I testify that he is also the light of the world. And I think that is a message that our community, our state, and our nation, and our world needs to hear. So, do you know who you're not? You are not only a political being, you are a witness of Jesus Christ. And that's what the Gospel of John is calling you to be. You are a witness of Jesus Christ. And you know what? You're not alone in that. And, and I think our witness is more powerful even when we stand with people to proclaim that who we, dis, who we differ with politically sometimes. So here's my challenge for this week. I would like for you to ask God, just be honest, ask God, where are places where our identity is stronger in something else than it is in Jesus? Is your identity for your baseball team stronger than your identity with Jesus? Is your identity as a parent stronger is your identity with a politician or against a politician uh, stronger than your identity with Jesus? Because if our identity with him is so strong, then we are not going to be divided. We're united in Christ, and we are not alone. You are not alone. You are not alone. God is in this. God has not left you alone. So we are united. So that connection is going to be a source of stability for us going to help us to identify with other people who are different than we are, and we don't have to carry all the burdens of the world, but we can join with other people in proclaiming that Jesus is the light of the world. May it be so. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are the light of the world, and we are not alone. We, help, we ask you, God, we, we do ask you for peace in our country, but we ask more importantly for peace here in this room that we will proclaim with a unified voice that you are Lord over all, no matter what happens. And no matter what happens, we are together connected to you and we bring this message that you are the light of the world. May it be so, we pray in Christ's name, amen.